Hello, welcome to Arts and Design Monday and to our final event in No Regrets, a celebration of Marlon Riggs. I'm Kate Mackay, Associate Film Curator here at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, and I'm, I'm delighted to have you all here tonight for this finale for our three-month-long series celebrating Mar Riggs. Um, I have a bunch of thank yous off the top um, and, and acknowledgments. Art and Design Monday is organized and sponsored by UC Berkeley's Arts and Design Initiative. The series is co-curated by the Art, Technology, and Culture Colloquium at the Berkeley Center for New Media, the Department of Art Practice, the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, the Digital Humanities at Berkeley, the Arts Research Center, and the Graduate School of Journalism, and the Richmond Arts and Culture Commission. Uh, so thanks to all of those people for making this happen. I'd also, I'd really like to thank um, the Berkeley Arts and Design, the pe people working at Berkeley Arts and Design for really being enthusiastic about including Marlon Riggs in their series this fall. And thanks to Catherine Wallerstein and Paris Coates for their help um, organizing this. I'd like to thank the Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism also for their enthusiastic response to the series and Professor Deidre English and Dean Edward Wasserman for their support of, this, of these programs. And a special thank you to Vivian Kleinman for really spearheading the initiative to celebrate Riggs's work on the 30th anniversary of Tongues Untied. Um, she's been at screenings and arranging screenings really around North America and around the world um, to, so people get a chance to either discover Riggs for the first time or be refresh uh, their memory of the film. Uh, and I would really like to thank all the friends, collaborators, students, and fans that have been here for these past three months to share these screenings with us. Um, I'd also like to thank the distributors California Newsreel and Frameline for their support. I mean, we've, tr we've tried to show the best possible materials we could get, and tonight we have a, a DCP of Tongues Untied from California Newsreel, and it does, uh, from frame line and it does really make a difference when you get to see this film in a space where you really get to hear it and see it so we're really glad to show it here. Um, to, the order of events tonight is we will watch the film and then we'll be joined by three members of the Berkeley faculty to discuss Riggs's legacy um, to have a brief conversation about Riggs's legacy and maybe open it up to questions and comments from you guys afterwards. Uh, I'm going to introduce our speakers off the top so that after the screening we can just get right into it. Um, so we have Derek B. Scott uh, from the Department of African American Studies. His teaching and research interests include 20th and 21st century African American literature, creative writing, queer theory, LGBTQ studies, race, gender, and sexuality and fantasy, science fiction, and comic books. He is the author of Extravagant Objection, Blackness, Power, and Sexuality in, in the African American Literary Imagination. And he's also the, the author of several novels, including Hex, A Traitor to the Race, and he's also the editor of Best Gay Black Erotica that came out in 2004. Uh, Ken Light is Professor Ken Light from the, the the Graduate School of Journalism is the Riva and David Logan Professor and the curator at the Center for Photography. Um, he's worked as a freelance documentary photography for over 45 years, focusing on social issues in America. And his work has been published in nine books, in magazines, exhibitions, and numerous anthologies, exhibition catalogs, and a variety of media, digital, and most motion pictures. And he's exhibited internationally in over 225 one-person and group shows. And he currently has a show up at the Townsend, um, the center of the, the Townsend Center for the Arts on campus. So I would encourage you to go check that out. Uh, Lila Weifer is an artist, writer, and curator who works in Oakland and has received her MFA, their MFA from Mills College. Uh, Weifer is teaching in the art practice department at UC Berkeley this fall, 
and her practice, their practice considers the complexities of phenomenological blackness through video installation, printmaking, and lecture performances. In 2018-19, Weifer was the guest lecturer at the New Genres Department at San Francisco Art Institute, and as a member of the Black Aesthetic, co-curated an amazing series of screenings that were here uh, last year at BAM PFA from our film and video collection. Her solo exhibition, Between Beauty and Horror, um, was at the Aggregate Space Gallery in Oakland, a fabulous installation uh, that ran in February and March uh, this year. So without further ado, please enjoy the film and we'll join you afterwards for conversation. Thanks for being here. So I'll just begin by, by saying that this, this uh, screening is, is really an event to, you know, it's bringing Marlon Riggs back back home. I mean, he, Riggs was a student of the Graduate School of Journalism, and he taught here uh, right up until his death. As part of this series, we showed his thesis project film, and so it's a, it's a really remarkable opportunity to talk about his significance for Berkeley as well as beyond Berkeley. And when I was thinking of who I wanted to be in part of this conversation, I was thinking about how remarkable Riggs's works are. Because of their complexity, they are as relevant as literature or poetry, as essays, as journalism, as pieces of visual art, as you know, a record of dance and movement. And so they, they sort of speak across the different departments and disciplines at UC Berkeley, so I thought we, we will have, have somebody, people to represent these different departments, and maybe I could ask each of you to talk a little bit about what Riggs's work means for your own practice, your own intellectual field, and, and how it's influenced you. And maybe start with Kent, Professor Light. Yeah, well, um this film makes me very happy and very sad um, because I was a colleague of Marlin's and um, I remember him working in the J School and inspiring students and uh, sadly watching his flame disappear, which was uh, very, very hard. Um, and I think the amazing thing about the film is it is, it's, was revolutionary then and it's revolutionary now. Um, and the way he made the film and the voices, uh, it just continues to resonate, which I think uh, often in documentary film is, can be really hard. Um, and um, he was an inspiration, I know, for our students and, and for our faculty. And if I have time, I have some comments from... Yeah, yeah. sure. So um, my colleague, uh, Andy Stern, who re retired J School professor, um, this, this morning shared some of his um, long ago experiences and Andy uh, uh, worked with Marlon closely. Um, he, uh, Marlon assisted Andy on his film uh, about nuclear arms race um, and he was Andy's student at the J School. Um, and Andy said when, he, when Marlon's application came to the school, uh, Andy asked the dean, who was then Ed Bailey, who was our first dean, if he could bring Marlon out for an interview. And, and um, Ed said, sure. So Andy tracked Marlon down at the Fourth, Fort Worth, Texas television station. Uh, his application said he was applying to Columbia J School as well as Berkeley. And when he came on the phone, he said he had already decided to come to Berkeley because we had a two-year program. Uh, he came. He was brilliant. His master's documentary um, was on the Oakland Blues, was made with his classmate Peter Webster, and it won the Student Academy Award. Um, Tongue, Tongues was uh, created and edited on our facilities at the journalism school, um, which, ha which at that time we had a doc lab in Juenel Hall, um, since moved to Northgate. Um, and Andy remembered when uh, he brought the then dean, Tom Goldstein, to view Tongues. Uh, uh, Tom asked that a, a very short segment, uh, which were um, magazine cutouts of erect black penises, you might have seen that early in the film, um, which were from magazines, uh, that that shot be removed. Um, and Andy refused, because Andy was working closely with, with Marlon. 
Um, and Tom was afraid that the university would get in trouble. Um, and partly because Marlon had raised uh, something like two or $3,000 from the Colorado Humanities uh, Council for his film. Um, and some of you, those of you my age, might remember um, the, the National Endowment for the Arts, which then funded the Humanities Council in Colorado, uh, was, was being attacked at that time uh, by, uh, because of the showing of Robert Mapplethorpe's work, uh, which was exhibited in Cleveland, and also there was a, an exhibition called The Perfect Moment, uh, which, was sent to the, which was supposed to arrive at the Corcoran Gallery in Washington in 1989, uh, four months after Mapplethorpe had died uh, at 42 uh, from HIV AIDS. Uh, this exhibit, both of these exhibits, so enraged Jesse Helms, the right-wing senator, um, who, who put together um, reproductions of four offending images from the show, uh, including one of a pubescent girl exposing herself, one of a naked boy. Uh, he sent this to several senators, uh, and the Post called them Helms' indecent sampler. Um, and, and this act um, outraged uh, the Senate, and they uh, withdrew the funding for the National Endowment for the Arts, particularly for individual arts grants. Um, and this was the era in which tongues was created. And so I say, you know, um, Marlon was, was so brave uh, to do that, uh, particularly with, with uh, the subject. Uh, Andy says, um, tongues was not shown on many PBS stations. So you have to remember back then there was no Netflix, there was no Amazon, there was four channels, and PBS. Um, he said the local PBS network affiliate, KQED, showed it at midnight, mm. uh, which is kind of shocking now. Um, he said that uh, we should all remember that when Marlon died, um, over 500 people came to his funeral. He was, he was beloved in the community. He was beloved here at the university by his students, by our faculty. Uh, but that there were numerous churches that refused to host a funeral for Marlon uh, because they were homophobic at that point, which is hard to believe. Um, and one of the participants in the film, Bob Paris, who's, who's uh, thanked in the movie, um, sent a note to Andy, which Andy passed on to me. He said, well, tonight is about tongues untied itself. In many ways, it still remains incredibly meaningful to a new generation of queer men of color and, and of course others, and I think it is good and proper that they screen the film whenever they can. If I were doing a documentary on Marlon, I would consider not only why he came to Berkeley, but why he stayed in Berkeley. The latter has to do, I think, with the genu genuine warmth and support he received from others, from Andy Stern, his faculty advisor. Uh, with Andy's uh, connection was pivotal. Uh, I don't think that Marlon had a good relationship with his dad, and the respect and mentoring uh, from someone like Andy was critical in uh, the making of this film. And of course, Marlon was a humanist. He was not a small thinker. He was not politically correct. And of course, his work is transcendent. Even when he focuses on black gay ident identity and tongues, the message is universal, one of self-understanding, love, tenderness. Um, and I agree that was Marlon. And um, he was a force in our program. Um, yeah, it's very, it's very hard to watch this. I mean, he was, it, it's, it's sad to think where he would be now as a filmmaker mm -hmm. if he had not died of, of um, AIDS. Just sad, uh, the people who were, the creative people who were lost who we saw, uh, there are many pictures. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. It was really sweet. Um, well, first, let me say, I, I'm a visual artist. Uh, I do large-scale video installation. Um, and under that sort of umbrella, I do, um, I would say I fall under expanded cinema, experimental film, et cetera. Um, and under that, or within that practice, I generally explore um, the sensorial memory and the imagination, sensorial imagination in film in the ways that film can access and engage parts of our senses, and not just the obvious ones, not just auditory and visual, but the more primitive senses like touch and taste and smell. And uh, if this work was nothing, it was, it was extremely sensorial. Uh, and I think, you know, just to put this into some context, this film came out the year I was born. 
<laughs> and uh, I was actually watching uh, watching an interview with um, Melissa Anderson and Michael Korsky about uh, queer desire in film, and um, she was saying Melissa was saying um, that her cinephilia sort of blossomed when her homosexuality did. And I kind of like that as this metaphor for like the time that I was born and this film coming out at the same time. And I would say that when I when I established myself as a, you know, a filmmaker, a video artist, um, that is certainly when I came into my homosexuality. And, uh, you know, Marlon Riggs just like being so, I guess, fl free and, uh, you know, fluid with the, you know, seeing the moving image as, as material um, and in this un uninhibited way that he uh, uses this uh, cacophonous dialogic uh, soundtrack and all these different layering effects and uh, transitions and, you know, it, it's extremely tactile. And even when you think about the poster image for the film, it's, you know, two men embracing. And if, you know, no, if, it, if that says nothing else, it says that, black blackness and queerness is protective but it's also like it's also haptic it's also sensual it's also tactile um yeah i think this film really allowed me to explore the the sensorial properties of filmmaking in my work uh so it's it's funny to hear that's the year you were born because i was actually in the castro theater when this film premiered um, <laughs> at the uh, San Francisco uh, the Lesbian Film Festival. Um, and it's interesting when I, when I see the film, again, as I've seen it a few times and I've, I've taught it uh, in, in classes, um, at the time that I saw it, and I was young <laughs> at the time, uh, but when I saw it, I, um, it was, I think the sort of, the film's announced project of creating a kind of black gay male visibility and articulating a black gay male voice was the thing that I responded most strongly to because it was such a kind of powerful and visceral achievement of that. Um, it's an extension in a lot of ways of the, the work that was already being done with uh, the late Joseph Beam's uh, anthology in the life, which they show on, which he shows in the, the, the film. Um, and they read some pieces of his. Um, but it's so much more uh, visceral, you know, because you're actually listening to voices and seeing people who are black and gay who are articulating themselves. And I responded very strongly to that uh, back in 1989. Um, looking at it this time, I feel like what's interesting to me is recognizing that the context of AIDS with the uh, existential threat to life, um, to each of the, to, from Riggs, for many of the people who were in the film, uh, for many of the people who are in the audience. Um, what seems to be really palpable for me is a sense of tension uh, and a combativeness that is a part of the, of the film. There's a, to me, there's almost kind of a, there's a, a double layer. On the one hand, the, the, the visual images are often kind of slow and elegiac and soft and soft focus whereas the vocal performances are very sharp edged and very critical uh, in terms of the content and very uh, hard, I'd almost say, in terms of the energy often. Um, and the sort of criticism that's being, um, being articulated about homophobia in the black community, about racism in the white gay community, uh, criticism also gets directed towards other black gay men for not being able to uh, break their silence, be part of a community. Um, criticism that Riggs himself is directing towards himself for his obsessive interest in white men. All these things are there, and it's kind of like there's, there are these counterattacks that are in the midst of a crossfire, and it just feels like he's feeling, he's hitting out at all kinds of directions, and it's, it seems so much that it's a part of that, um, that extremely, I think almost probably for us today, if we don't remember it, somewhat unimaginable context of immense pressure um, and the, the sort of grace and beauty with which he engages in this combat is really interesting and 
uh, inspiring to me. Um, and also, I think it, it kind of articulates a vision of community that he talks about when he talks about, I think he's reading uh, from, or at least part of reading from Joseph Beam's piece on home, but um, where he's articulating this idea of not a sort of seamless unity in, in terms of community, but a community where you could be free to fight uh, and speak the truth. And uh, I, that's still, that, that's for me what I find most uh, moving about this particular time that I've read, uh, that I've seen the film. Mm. Thank you. I'm, and when you were, you're speaking about Beam, and maybe you could speak a little bit uh, for people that might not be familiar with all the sources that that Marlon is drawing from, like he, because this is really, he's really bringing forward the, you know, uh, the voices of other poets, other artists. I think I saw the part of a Martin Wong painting in the film, which I'd never actually really recognized before, but we had a Martin Wong exhibition here not so long ago. And so it's, it's really, it, it's a very rich tapestry of other voices that he pulls forward. So maybe you could talk a bit, little bit about those. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, the one thing that strikes me too about the film is that uh, as much as it's clearly a kind of key foundational text in uh, black visual studies, black film studies, um, it's also a kind of document of black literary history uh, in that he's, he's, uh, he's vocal performances of six of Essex Hemphill's poems, of uh, four other poets, Donald Woods, uh, Alan Miller, um, and then a number of pieces that uh, Joseph Beam, who collected that anthology and the life, uh, put together, um, as well as I think the, I, I think that that piece about the 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 guys on the bus. I think that's actually Essex Hemphill's memoir piece. So they're all these different, uh, from a, a literary scholar's perspective, which is what my field is. But they're all these uh, written pieces that he's brought together and have, have they're they're visually interpreted and then and vocally performed in really interesting ways. And uh, it's, you know, it's, a, it, it's very much a kind of literary film work from that perspective. Yeah. And uh, in terms of uh, the, the, this film as a piece of journalism, I mean, it's obviously quite a, a radical and unusual piece of journalism. And how, you know, how was it, how did it influence the way how did Mar how did Marlin influence the way journalism is taught here at UC Berkeley, or and does his this legacy of this kind of radical work still exist? Well, he was very influential as the director of the, our documentary program, and um, very uh, very passionate about filmmaking, which infected all the students that studied with him um, and looked up to him. And I think that. Um, the, the style that he initiated was then brought forward by John Els, who was our next, the, uh, the next person who ran our documentary program. Um, and I think it's partly just the passion that he had about making films that was inspiring. I mean, he has own, I think his style is his own, uh, which, which is just, as I said, really beautiful to, to look at. Um, but he just had this love of telling stories um, and I think what was said about the sound is really, I mean, the sound in this is just remarkable and beautiful and flowing. Um, and I think way ahead of its time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there are films now kind of just catching up to what Marlon did, which is pretty, pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. and, and Lila, what would you say, I mean, what, you're sort of a, immersed in this, the world of the work that you do and looking at other artists who, you know, you, you are similar to exploring similar themes, uh, going in similar directions. Can, can you talk a little bit about where you see Marlon's influence in other people's work and other colleagues' work? Definitely. Uh, I actually just showed uh, one of these films to my class uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago, but Jen and Kiru's Black to Techno is, is an example of, of that, of the, the, the sort of mixed form, um, using voice as uh, lyric and uh, using poetry turned into this sort of like rhythmic, um, you know, patterning throughout the film. Um, and another one is uh, Terrence Nance. Um, 
obviously Arthur Jaffa, I think a lot of a lot of uh, contemporary video artists and filmmakers are 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 learning or you know their styles developed on the heels of Marlon Riggs's work um and just like seeing how tangible his presence is in, in contemporary film works is really beautiful mm -hmm. I think I was struck today watching it and looking at all the slow motion that he uses. Yeah. And I was like, oh yeah, all these guys like Khalil Joseph and Arthur Jaffa, they they all they all use slow motion in sort of very different and very effective ways. And I had I never really thought about that the the contrast the slow motion in in rigs before, even though it's there and I've seen this film a bunch of times, that it never really hit me that the way that's sort of come through this history of black filmmaking. Absolutely. That's really interesting. Um and I've i I've just wonder when you what you think about what this what this film means now. Like it it's we I mean, it obviously still feels fresh to me today. It feels like it has, it's like nothing else, but how, how, how would you present this film to students and thinkers? How do you teach it now? Well, I mean, for me, um, when I've taught it recently, I taught it in a course uh, that I co-taught with Nadia Ellis in English. It was called Black Plus Queer. Um, and there, I think we were seeing it as a, I mean, again, sort of setting the foundation for all kinds of black visual cultural production subsequent to it, um, but also as uh, a record and a document of a particular moment um, where you have the actual emergence onto the political slash cultural social stage of uh, black gay male identity where it had not really uh, existed as such before. Um, so um, I think of it as, you know, kind of being this, it, it's a sort of a, it's almost like a, it's a, it's a groundwork. I mean, it sets the terms for so many things that then flow from it. Yeah, I would definitely say it's a groundwork for sure. I've actually yet to teach it, um, but just kind of like feel, following what you just said about gender and queerness, uh, just as someone who identifies as non-binary, I think this film sort of gave me access to, or even permission, I would say, to, to explore masculinity. And I think, you know, when gender and, uh, you know, pronoun issues come up in my classrooms, uh, this is sort of a, a film that, it comes up a lot uh, and if you know this film kind of shows me that now gender is this sort of asymptotic thing and the space and the gaps between you know male black gay maleness uh, black uh, women lesbian queer all of those spaces are sort of closing in on each other uh, and I think it's creating a really like important conversation on how we sort of address our bodies mm -hmm. uh, and our gayness with each other. Yeah, it's interesting because I think that in Black is Black Ain't, um, Riggs kind of does the same thing with blackness. He talks about the, the full spectrum of blackness and how, so the, in here, in Tongues Untied, you get this sort of full spectrum of gender in a way, or the, at least the possibility for that. Yes. Yeah, I just was going to say, I, I, I wish that in Marlon's era that we had Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, all these mediums for, for this message to get out, because it was so, so limited when he, when he made it, and that's kind of sad, but the good thing is, you know, you're having this retrospective, and, and people can see it, and, and they're teaching it, which is the next, gen you know, generations are going to move forward with it. Um, and it's just amazing that it, that it um, still speaks today in, in, in such a loud voice. Uh, I just find that really remarkable. And I think there are actually, I think Vivian Kleinman told me that there are negotiations that it will be shown again on PBS maybe soon as an anniversary not thing. Not at midnight. Hopefully not at midnight, hopefully prime time where it deserves to be. Um, I'm wondering if, I think we have a little time, if there are any questions or comments from the audience. We have microphones 
And so if you have anything you would like to add, any reactions or responses, you can raise your hand and we'll bring you the microphone. Anyone have any? Yep, there's one here and then. Uh, I'm curious if any of you have uh, something to say about this film as a uh, documentary. Uh, I feel like uh, the range of styles in documentary, uh, even though there's more documentaries being produced every uh, day, it feels like now, the styles feel like they're becoming more and more uh, uh, narrow. And uh, I think, uh, I, I definitely think of this as a documentary film, but it's like a collage of so many different pieces of, of uh, art. And um, I, I'm curious if you see anybody in the um, making similar work that um, is defined still as a documentary. I think, I mean, the first person that comes to mind is who we said earlier, Arthur Jaffa, who did Love is Cooler, Love's, dreams are colder than death, excuse me. Uh, and Khalil Joseph, who, um, I mean, did a ton of works uh, on the, one on the Harlem, uh, one on Harlem, uh, and another one on um, Roy de Carava. Uh, and I think a lot of those, those contemporary filmmakers are using that similar style where they're layering and uh, using sound in this very ma materialistic way. Yeah, but I do I do think it's true that it's quite remarkable that Marlon made this thinking about making it for broadcast. And when I think there are many filmmakers who are using sort of documentary as a hybrid form or making art that has as documentary that's shown in galleries or in museums. But for broadcast, I find that the form of documentaries is, is actually seems more narrow to me than than this would suggest. So I think, that, I mean, I think that my hope when I rewatch this and when I think of it taught to new generations of students is that people will have the power to experiment with more with documentary form and that ho hopefully with the proliferation of ways to stream things that there will be uh, and new audiences for works that can be as radical and as, you know, radical works of art that are still documentaries. That's my hope. Is it a question here? <laughs> so, hi, I'm, my name's Cornelius Moore, and um, I knew Marlon, I'm in the film, and, uh, but I want to say something. I don't think Marlon made this for broadcast. No? No, no, he was, um, no, no, when he, he, uh, he, so he told me about when he wanted to do this and it, it was going to be simpler, it was going to be experimental, it was going to be short, and then it grew, um, really after he got very ill and he had so much to say and he sort of broadened it out and included um, other voices in the community. The fact that it got broadcast was because it got submitted to the POV series and they showed it that in their I think I don't know if it was their inaugural program but it was the first in the series um in that year so it was a kind of a I mean it was a pleasant thing but I don't think he thought that that's what he was he was going to do it was going to be a you know a festival film and shown around in theaters and in community groups and things like that Oh, thanks. Thanks for that. That's really interesting because I was thinking of the, the films he made before this that were very specifically for television and broadcast. So I kind of assumed that it was just like on the same trajectory. So that's really... Yeah, but also because I think he he would talk about how huh. working with this was would sort of disrupt his his way of making films. Uh -huh. we, Ethnic Notions was a, you know, a film about black, anti-black stereotypes and color adjustment after finishing after this were definitely kind of the kind of style that uh -huh. he was kind of journalistic maybe sort of style and this was really different. Uh -huh. Thank you. Sure. Any other comments or questions? Yes, we heard. <laughs> uh, 
thank you for uh, being here and speaking on this work. Um, I just had a quick question. I, I haven't seen this film in years, honestly, but it inspired me um, just as a creative person to originally get into documentary filmmaking and like take it seriously. Um, and you've touched on this question before, like in pieces, but I'm interested to know, like, say I'm showing this to a group of students for the first time, um, young adults who are, you know, who may not have access to this type of film, who may not have access to the type of film Mm, that isn't just in the mainstream that we might see nowadays, you know, because, I mean, even though we have Netflix and Hulu, you can't find Tongues Untied on there. Um, so, like, I guess my point being, or my question is, what things, what questions do you have students look at to say, hey, this is a film that was groundbreaking, it's still groundbreaking today, um, and how it talks about documentary and it talks about all, all these political subjects and obviously the how... He talks about them, they're connected, right? Um, but what questions do you give students? You say, hey, what about this? You know, what, what about this slow motion? What about the people staring, you know, staring right at the audience? What pieces of this film might you guide other students to think about their own documentary work and their own practice? I hope that makes sense. <laughs> if not, I can clarify. Well, I don't teach documentary film, so um, I haven't shown it to my students, but I'm, I'm doing a documentary film, and it's really interesting to see what Marlon did and how he stitched all these different types of, of, um, of image making, from using the black backdrop to uh, archival footage to um, uh, people talking and voguing, and I mean, it's just really, amazing how it's all stitched together and, and I, I mean if I was showing it to my students I would just say you know this is a perfect example of a, of a great filmmaker who's thinking out of, outside the box and, it, and I think when you make documentary films you need to think that way and unfortunately um, a lot of the films we're seeing I think it's partly because of, of corporate interests like Netflix and having control over filmmaking it's not happening as much as it should be happening and I think that's one of the great things about Marlon. He was, he was making films in the age when you didn't have that. You, you couldn't go to Netflix or Hulu or Amazon or, um, you know, the, the networks didn't even take documentary films from anyone, so there was PBS, um, and that was about it. So it gave, I think it gave him a lot more freedom to do what he really wanted to do from his heart. Um, and I guess I would tell my students, follow, follow your heart. Make what you want to make, and, and you know, the rest will come. <laughs> um, I think something that I, uh, something that I do with my students often is try to put them in their bodies as much as possible. And because this is a film that is like focusing on the body, like the black male body is the focal point. I would ask my students to first locate. A part, what part of their body responded to what part of the film, um, and try to address what emotions or feelings they have that are connected to whatever conceptual part of the film they were, you know, watching or experiencing, and try to tease tease that through. Uh, and I think a lot comes out when you when you put students in their bodies first. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, when I teach it, I teach it from a kind of cultural studies perspective, and so I'm not really teaching documentary filmmakers, you know, so I'm not really thinking about it in those terms. Um, so for me, I think it's probably more I'm interested in directing students to think about the, the, the way that the perspective of the film is, on the one hand, um, there is a certain centeredness to it that, you know, seems to come out of Marlon's own performances, uh, I think especially in tandem with Essex Hemphill's, um, but there's also a way where there's a very splintered perspective, that, that there's just a lot, there are a lot of different, you know, you can say it in kaleidoscope or something like that, but there, there are lots of different perspectives that seem to be there that um, I think are challenging to our conception of, you know, how a film is done, uh, what it, how you go about documenting something, uh, but then also 
to how you conceive of a political position. Um, so, um, and how you conceive of community, which I think is so much a part of what the, the film is about. So for me, I would, I direct students towards those kinds of questions and concepts. And I mean, really, I mean, looking at it again tonight, I thought you could just do a master class in this film. Just like it, you could do week one could be editing, week two could be use of the close up, week three could be, I mean, it because it just like every layer and every different aspect of it is so rich. So to study it closely and, and look at all the different techniques he uses could, I think, be really rewarding. Because every time I see it, I see new things in it, for sure. Is there any other? Any last? Go oh. um, something that was very interesting to me in watching this film again was seeing not only the kind of incredible focus of this person who's able to take their personal narrative and then like expand it into a community narrative, but is also to kind of see the city as the backdrop in that time period and the people involved in the film in that time period and that sense of kind of community support and these kind of roots that are being built around each other. And I'm curious if you see in your own students an ability or drive also in this kind of mode to kind of exist outside of maybe just navel gazing and more into a, a realm of <laughs> <laughs> building community or like being able to utilize one's fire narrative to create larger networks. I, I think that for um, the strongest or the most articulate response that I remember a student uh, having to this in the, the last time I taught it, which was in that black plus queer class, which was a graduate course, so there were PhD students, um, was a kind of a lament about not having the community that this seemed to be assuming or building in the course of its um, of the film itself and, uh, and, and in the way it exists kind of in the history uh, of uh, black culture production. So, um, I, I mean, I, I guess that would mean that he's, you know, he's, he's not wanting to be navel gazing, he's wanting you know, for there to be a community that he sees no, no longer really existing, which was sad to me to, to think that that's the case, that he thinks that's the case. I'm not sure whether I know that is the case, but uh, his perception is that this was kind of like a, a golden moment in uh, black gay political, cultural history and that it's past. So I don't know if that answers your question. But. Other comments on that? <laughs> <laughs> well, if there are no other questions or comments, I would just really like to thank our pro professors, Ken Light, Lila Weifer, and Derek B. Scott for being here to talk about this wonderful film. And look for it on TV, hopefully, sometime soon. On Vimeo. On, and on Vimeo, yeah. So thanks, thanks Cornelius. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.